Um, our next speaker is Viber um, um, Jerich. Uh, he'll talk about the mystery structure in our galaxy found with uh, low far observations. Okay, thank you. So uh, today I will present uh, some uh, recent results obtained with the LOFAR observations of interstellar medium and actually discuss mysterious structures, which you can see in the background, that we discovered in our galaxy. So just let's say a few words about uh, the LOFAR radio telescope. So it's the low frequency array, which is sensitive to ob uh, uh, astronomical observations at low radio frequencies, so between 10 and 250 megahertz. And the important uh, characteristics of the LOFAR telescope that the wide frequency coverage and also available high angular uh, resolution, because it's interferometer, uh, makes LOFAR a unique instrument actually to map galactic polarized emission uh, and its polarization at resolution which is hardly affected by beam depolarization. And then if we combine the LOFAR observations with the RM synthesis method that we heard in the previous talk, actually uh, this allow us to do a Faraday tomography. So actually we are able uh, to disentangle the relative distribution of synchrotron emitting and Faraday rotating regions and magnetic field properties along the line of sight. And actually here, once more, just to remind ourselves that if we see a structure at a certain Faraday depth, denoted here with phi, actually we see uh, the product of a thermal electron density and parallel component of magnetic field. Another important thing that uh, people need to take uh, uh, that in all um, uh, Faraday studies, one need to remember that actually the resolution uh, in terms of Faraday depth, but also the scale to which we are sensitive is always proportional to the lambda square. So either to the spectral bandwidth or to a minimum frequency at uh, which we are observing. So actually, if you compare the resolution in Faraday tomography at different frequencies, so here is at 150 and 350 megahertz, you see that resolution uh, is order of magnitude different. And then if you go even to higher frequencies, your resolution is even three to four times poorer than uh, at low radio frequencies. So also when you are, we are talking about the Faraday thin and Faraday thick structures, one also needs to remember that these are a kind of uh, a relative terms because all of them depend on the lambda square space so it's possible that if at certain frequency we see Faraday thick structures, at the other th frequency will be Faraday thin or other way around. So uh, the low for observations, because we are really observing at low radio frequencies, give us really a unique resolution in Faraday depth of one radian per square meter, which means that we are very sensitive to small column densities of interstellar medium. And here is just to remind ourselves how the galactic emission looks uh, in uh, different frequency regimes. So on the left, uh, le left hand side, we see the total intensity. And then on the right hand side, we see the polarized intensity at higher frequencies and the slightly lower frequencies. And actually we see that if we see the structures of polarized emission at lower frequencies, all of this emission and small scale features that, we, that are present here, while are not visible here, are caused by Faraday rotation and depolarization effects. And actually, uh, before uh, the MWA and uh, LOFAR and other low frequency arrays, most of the people expected actually that we will not see a lot of polarized emission at these low frequencies, because they expected that most of the emission will be depolarized. Well, as you will see now uh, in these movies, 
uh, we see a huge amount of structures and the brightness temperature of this emission is of order of a few Kelvin. So actually here you see uh, the RM movies, so the slices of different Faraday depth, so the Faraday tomography of free fields at high galactic latitudes observed with the low far in the frequency range between 115 and 175 megahertz. And actually the resolution of these images is roughly three arc minutes, but we can also make a much higher resolution images. And one immediately th see, uh, thing that you see if you compare these three fields, that we see a huge amount of all kinds of structures. And also the Faraday depth range in these th three fields is also quite different. For example, in 3C96 field, we see structures between minus three and eight radians per square meter in Elias field from minus 10 to plus 13. But then in NCP field, we see diffuse emission all the way to minus 45 radians per square meter. But even if we take a closer look to the structures that we see, you will immediately see that uh, we see a lot of filamentary structures, which is also present in H1 uh, observations or dust observations. So for example, here you see all of these uh, uh, straight filaments in Elias field, or for example in 3C196 field, where we also have a very prominent and very straight filament just right in the middle of the field. So now let's take a closer look to the 3C196 field and try uh, to explain what we see here. Uh, but before this, so before I go to the details of uh, the model, or let's say the physical picture which produces uh, this emission, I will here just show the 3C196 observation, uh, but obtained at 350 megahertz with the Weseborg telescope. And since the resolution in terms of Faraday depth is 10 times poorer than at the lower frequencies, actually this one slice summarizes all the structures that we observe at lower frequencies. And immediately what you can say by comparing this image with the previous image, that most of the emission that we see at the lower frequencies is simply depolarized at these higher frequencies. And the only features that we see uh, is, for example, the filament, the central filament. And the other feature, which is a kind of the opposite case, of the surrounding emission that here we have a depolarized bar-like structure uh, at lower frequencies, while at Weseborg frequencies, this feature is uh, really a prominent feature in this field. So now let's look what is a kind of a physical picture uh, of this emission. So we were actually lucky enough that we also discovered a pulsar uh, in this field, which is approximately located here. And then our physical model is that we have a multiple components along the line of sight. So emission B, it's a kind of a faint and patchy background emission arising at uh, Faraday rotation of plus 4.5. Then we have a prominent foreground emission A, which is plotted here, which we associate, it, associate with the edge of our local bubble. And then we have a number of uh, Faraday uh, rotating uh, so basically, uh, horizontal filamentary non-emitting magnetized plasma, which is displacing the background emission uh, to the foreground emission. Because basically, if you uh, combine all of these images, as it's shown here, all of this uh, emission nicely fits in. So basically, we are confident, confident that the features which we see here in emission are nothing else but uh, Faraday uh, 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 rotating uh, regions which are displacing the background emission our, in our galaxy. And then using all kind of assumptions, you can also put a constraint on the properties of a magnetic field with, uh, within this field. And for example, uh, here we, are, we see that we have a gradient of magnetic field and also magnetic field reversal. And then a further, you can put upper or lower limits on a certain physical properties of ISM. Further, we took the low far observations and combined them uh, with the Planck uh, dust polarization maps. And actually here with uh, the lines, 
we plot the orientation magnet of magnetic field as probed by Planck, and immediately you see that most of the structures, so basically these two filaments, are following the orientation of magnetic field as probed by Planck. In addition, even if you look at small scale features, like for example the bending of this line, bends in the same way uh, as the filament detected with the LOFAR. So actually this result is quite surprising because the LOFAR and Planck are sensitive to two different magnetic field components and also uh, in different ISM phases. So are we seeing the warm partially ionized medium or interaction between these two phases? Actually, we need to investigate further. In addition to these filaments, we also see a lot of features which we call depolarization canals, which are actually parts uh, in the sky we, where we don't detect uh, any emission in polarization. And actually, the surprising property of these polarization canals is that they are extremely straight. Some of them are parallel uh, to galactic uh, planes, so the galactic plane runs uh, here. Uh, but some of them are in just random orientations, and some of these features are even perpendicular to the galactic plane. So, we also looked uh, for other regions uh, surrounding the 3C196 field, and also in all fields we actually see uh, these very straight uh, depolarization canals, and actually we have no clue what they are really. So, what is their origin? So, the origin and straightness of uh, these observed structures, it's a real mystery. So, this opens immediately a lot of questions. So, are they a projection effect of complicated morphology in the magnetic field or in ionized gas distribution? Are they shaped by turbulent motions in the ISM, uh, which stretches, compresses gas into filaments and sheets? Or are they associated maybe with the fast moving uh, stars? Because you must say that uh, these straight lines really looks like a kind of uh, uh, traces of uh, planes that we see in the sky or maybe spaceships. <laughs> or uh, are they maybe uh, somehow associated with H1 fibers or a very, very local ISM? And actually currently we don't know uh, the answer to this. So, I would say uh, that uh, the study of uh, interstellar medium at the low radio frequencies just once more confirms that in order to understand all the effects in ISM, the only way forward is really to do the multi-frequency observation and then try to combine these uh, with simulations. So, to conclude, we see a lot of uh, rich morphology in polarized emission detected with the LOFAR. Uh, the probed interstellar medium is mostly close by, so within 200 parsecs, somewhere within the local bubble. We discovered many filamentary features and linear depolarization canals, whose origin we don't know. And also, some of these uh, filamentary structures show a signature in the dust Planck polarization maps, which shows to a common underlying physical structure. So, surveying uh, a kind of a much larger area of the sky, and observation at, at other frequencies will hopefully give us the answers to these open questions. But one thing is for sure that actually the LOFAR telescope and other low frequency arrays opened a kind of a new field uh, in uh, Faraday tomography of the local ISM that will help us then to constrain its properties at an exquisite resolution that was actually uh, not possible to do it before of one radian per square meter. Thank you. So um, many years ago, I wrote a paper with Peter McCulloch on uh, a straight and narrow ionized filament. Uh, and for about a decade, it had zero citations. And now it has a couple, thanks to your work. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The, uh, I was wondering, I mean, that's an area where we saw this really incredibly narrow straight H alpha yep. filament. Uh, is that going to be observed with LOFAR? Because it could be, it should be. Yeah, so actually, uh, together with our collaborators from the Planck uh, collaboration, we did a follow-up observation uh, of the same filament. But I must say that preliminary results uh, are, are not indicating that we are sensitive to this filament uh, at lower frequencies. 
But now we are trying to see, because uh, this observation was also affected by some other instrumental effects, so now we are trying to make a higher resolution images because the H-alpha filament is very narrow. So it's much narrower than resolution that we are currently doing. So now we are testing all of these things and actually hoping to see something there. Yeah. Okay. So thanks, uh, Weidner. <laughs>